Insurance professionals work hard every day to keep people safe. But as technology transforms the industry, how can insurers protect not only their clients, but also shield themselves from ever-changing cyber risks? My name is Elizabeth Blossfield, and I'm the host of the Insuring Cyber Podcast, a bi-monthly look into how the world of cyber and the business of insurance are connected. Happy December, everybody, and welcome to the final episode of the Insuring Cyber Podcast of 2023. Don't worry, this podcast isn't going anywhere. We're just taking a short break for the holidays, and we'll be back with more content for you on January 17th with the first episode of the new year. In the meantime, all of our previous episodes from this year and previous seasons are on our website at insurancejournal.tv or wherever you get your podcasts. We've discussed so much on this podcast this year, but there's one topic that has stood out in almost every conversation, and that's AI. It seems it pops up in every conversation related to cyber and insurance recently, and there's still so much to discover about where AI could lead the insurance industry in the future. So I thought this would be a good time to look ahead to where AI and insurance might be headed in 2024, as well as discuss some practical ways insurers are implementing these tools into their business. I have three great guests to discuss this topic. My first guest is Jeffrey Bott, Chief Underwriting Officer and Head of Cyber at Para, a newly launched program at USQ Risk. USQ Risk is an international managing general agent specializing in alternative risk transfer solutions. In October, it announced the launch of Para, a managing general agent providing cyber and blended cyber and technology e and insurance to large U.S. corporate risks. Para is launching as a division of DESK, USQ Risk's managing general agent accelerator, and is the first program to be brought to market by DESK. Jeffrey has previously served in cyber leadership roles at MNC Bank, Amtrust Financial Services, and Trium Cyber US Services. And he was a senior client advisor at Marsh, as well as an associate deputy general counsel at the US Department of Defense. He spoke with me about how he sees a need for more specialized solutions in cyber and what his roles in both the public and private sectors have taught him about managing cyber risk. Check out our conversation. Hi, Jeffrey. It's great to be speaking with you today. How are you doing? Good, Elizabeth. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to be here. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you. And um, before we get into you know, our interview, I was just wondering if you could start off with an overview of some of your background and the work that you do at USQ Risk. Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, so my own background, I actually was a lot of my career before transitioning to cyber insurance was spent if I'm working in the public sector. I was an associate deputy general counsel at the U.S. Department of Defense. So I, I did really a lot of um, legal and policy work for many years. You know, my own background like that was that of a lawyer, but, um, you know, I heavily involved uh, in academia as well. I, I've been a, working for law school in Spain and also was a um, adjunct professor for American University's Coca School of Business, their MBA program. So really had a deep background in both cyber and law and national security. And then, you know, transitioned over to cyber insurance, um, worked at Marsh for several years where I was um, really helped to lead a lot of their their, their um, product innovation in terms of privacy regulatory and was a um, client advisor there. And um, then after one other role at MT Bank, I shifted over to the underwriting side um, and had senior roles of both um, Antrust Financial Services and at, at, at Trium US Cyber Services, the cyber underwriting teams there. And then obviously, um, by my, my, my current role now is Paris Chief Underwriting Officer and Head of Cyber. That's great. Well, I know that you have extensive background um, in this industry, so I'm really excited to dive into that in a little bit. Um, but before we get to that, I know there are some exciting initiatives going on at USQ Risk right now. And one of them is that they recently announced the launch of Para, as you mentioned. So why was the why was now the right time to launch this division? And can you talk a little bit about the work that it does in the cyber and EO space? Yeah, exactly. So basically USQ Risk is, is is our parent, right? And they created Desk, which is an MGA incubator and accelerator. And Para is the cyber division. So we're we're part of Desk. So so think of like as part of Desk, we're the we're the cyber focused team. And you know, for Para, really the most compelling thing was to have the ability to have the support of a highly respected global insurance carrier and in trust was extremely compelling. So it just, that was, that that really made it for me like a no brainer in, in, in terms of opportunity. And no, it can speak for the USQ risk team as well and make that determination. So would it be helpful to go uh, a little bit into detail about 
para about the risk appetite and about you know kind of what we're looking to do in the market yeah absolutely i would love that yeah sure so um para is focused on the large corporate space so i'd identify that as really looking at you know us entities large corporate you know, insureds that are going to be a billion and up in annual revenue. And we're looking to be an access player in that market. Um, I have a lot of prior experience underwriting those risks from both my time at Amtrust and Triumph and looking to continue that and grow that business. And it, it's, it's a pretty unique opportunity right now because there's been some market fluctuations over the past couple of years. And, um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're really excited about having that support from Chaucer. We're able to deploy 10 million in limit. We can support um, cyber standards loan and blended cyber tech, you know, and, um, you know, really our industry appetite is pretty risk agnostic. I mean, I know we'll go into a little bit later about what those optimalist risks look like, right? But from my own background and preference, as long as there's strong security controls in place, I'm pretty much on board and, you know, I'm really looking to build a sustainable book with that profile of entities in it. Yeah, that's great. That's really helpful background on what you're doing at Para. And it's a great time right now for a division like this, because there's so much going on in cyber and things are changing all the time. Um, I know you mentioned in the press release about the launch of this division that cyber is so dynamic and it continues to surprise even the most prepared organizations. So I was curious, um, as you just mentioned, you know, what are some of the emerging cyber risks that you're seeing right now? Sure, of course. Um, well, I think like right front and center, elf in the room is always like ransomware. It just doesn't seem to go away. I remember when I first started teaching in cybersecurity governance in um, as an adjunct in Spain, and it was back then in like 2016, 2015. It was much more of a focus on only, you know, like personal ransomware, right? And and obviously we've seen really from 2016 on it morph into this huge kind of entity based you know, risk that just doesn't seem to go away. And um, so again, continues to evolve and surprise, and really that's not going away anytime soon, in my experience, because human error and related vulnerability remains that primary path for threat actors to compromise you know targets right so i just feel like my own underwriting strategy and what my team will have going forward will really need to hone in on all signs of you know a proactive and holistic approach to cyber risk when looking at these entities because you want to make sure that like they're not just fighting yesterday's battle they're they have a proactive mindset towards avoiding that risk and having the right kind of precautions in place and i'd say to give you another example you know on, on the you know, top of everyone's mind these days is, of course, everything related to cloud security risk. Of course, cloud utilization is another, that's a key consideration for me, you know, and, and on the one hand, right, it's not always, you know, black or white, because on the one hand, and he's pushing their data off-prem is usually that positive indication that it lessens the scope of their vulnerability or risk on their internal network environment. But of course, is systemic risk and other issues that have been front and center for both not only carriers, but the reinsurance markets, right? Risk aggregation remains a concern. And so that's what I'm really what everyone's focused on when we're thinking about that scope of cloud risk. Yeah, that's helpful. And that kind of leads into my next question as well, because I know you mentioned that a lot of these cyber risks still have to do with human error and companies need to sort of take a proactive approach when dealing with cyber. So do you have anything else to add about some of the best steps that companies can take to stay on top of, you know, these risks and prepare as much as it, as they can? Sure. So I'll kind of quote some of my old, um, I'm sure some of my old students will be rolling their eyes if they're listening to this podcast, but <laughs> I always look for that redundant blend of really people class and technology. I know it sounds simple and it's like old building blocks for cybersecurity, but I really find it true because what that really telegraphs to me is that, you know, it sounds boring, but in reality, it really means there's a true defense in depth approach in place. And that really helps it gears toward limiting the scope of that internal um, unauthorized network access, right? So basically a threat actor doesn't have the ability to laterally move around as much, right? If you have those defense in depth tools in place, of course, you need to have an outside network perimeter as well as inside. Um, and obviously in the past few years, we've seen that shift more towards those, those, those internal network kind of tracking and tools. And, but importantly, what that does is it's not just a soundbite because it helps to over, Im, really improve and limit the overall scope of loss, right? And so for where I sit, right, is in terms of you know, de de deploying risk capital um, and in terms of perspective insurers and getting on, on programs, you know, for any insurer, MG in a similar boat, we're looking to back that type of horse in the race because, you know, those high level risk considerations are essential. It helps me map out what's optimal ventilation, certain attachment points, is this an overall risk we're supporting, and really helps to be a guide, so to speak, as to, is this a risk I want to support? And if so, where, what, what type of support are you offering and where? 
yeah, those are all helpful tips for organizations to follow. And, you know, I've also heard that as cyber risks are continuing to evolve, there's a need for more specialized solutions in the market as well. So I was wondering if you could talk about what you're seeing there and if you expect that to continue. Of course, in, in, I guess in general, right, scope of coverage available, that naturally evolves really as it should with change in the risk and threat environment. And I think we'll continue to see that dynamic continue forward. I think my own experience, right, I had that front row seat to those changes and implementing them during my time at Marsh, where I, I, I was really, you know, interfacing a lot of Marsh's biggest clients when the European Union was rolling out its uh, general data protection regulation, um, the GDPR. And, you know, really everyone was was waiting for the shoe to drop in terms of the scope of the related fines and penalties, whether cyber insurance policies would fully respond, partially respond, and so on. So I, I and the team there helped to develop bespoke coverage solutions and analytics of course, with carrier buying because we were in the broken side then. But that helped to really reassure clients that their scope of their cyber coverage would include and comprehensively respond to all those privacy regulatory events. So I think that that kind of dynamic will continue to see, you know, as the risk landscape continues to shift. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And as you mentioned, you have a lot of experience working in the insurance industry and, um, you know, given your previous experience as well as, you know, your work now at USQ Risk, I'm curious what your advice is for other insure techs for developing those specialized skills or, you know, what steps can they take to sort of identify their area of expertise? Yeah. So I, I say like, right, it's tricky with cyber insurance because I feel like there's so many people that gravitated to our space to have different backgrounds, right? So there's definitely not a one size fits all type of mindset or background, right? I think some of the best underwriters, the best brokers, it could be people that have obviously deep insurance background and transition over from other PNC lines, but then I've also seen, right, you know, just like like raw or just like straight up security analysts or consultants be highly dynamic and successful underwriters. So I think you can Anyone who's adapt to learning the other side, right? Whether it's a um, a security analyst or consultant learning insurance or vice versa, anyone who's highly adapt and, and a quick thinker and a quick learner is going to succeed. That said, I'd say like almost every other area of the global economy these days, cyber insurance market is becoming highly specialized. So you know there are significant differences and obstacles in place that are facing carriers or MGAs looking to focus on, you know, for example, large corporate risk cyber, middle market cyber, SME. So case in point, you know, prior to my own mid-career transition into the cyber insurance market, you know, most of my professional experience was focused on these broader strategic policy, economic considerations. And I, I feel like many times that's what made the transition over from a public sector national security role to becoming a cyber advisor and then being a broker and later underwriter relatively seamless. So it was all of that kind of like linear link between, you know, that large entity risk focus, bigger picture focus. And, you know, the same held true when I went over to the underwriting side. So that made large risk focus for underwriting for me a natural fit. And I would say likewise, you know, again, you, everyone has to be flexible and adapt, but at the same time, having those fundamental building blocks and relevant skill set and knowledge does help to smooth over the transition and, and quicken up the pace a bit. Yeah, that's great advice. And that sort of answers my next question as well, because as you mentioned, um, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, you have a really interesting background on the insurance side and also on the government side because you have a background in national security as well. So do you have anything else to add about how your experience working in the public sector has informed the work that you're doing now? So I was at um, the U.S. Department of Defense for about six years, and the best way to, you know, you wear a lot of different hats. It's very similar to a lot of other government roles where you're dealing with kind of sensitive political matters and you're, you know, you're kind of needing to be a bit of a Johnny on the spot almost, right, and provide advice and guidance on issues where there really is no precedent, right? So that was, I think, a great proving ground for me in terms of understanding and being prepared for a, a dynamic risk like cyber, right? That really, you know, no one had, there's relevant examples in terms of, you know, kind of organizational risk management and other considerations, but no one had seen something with really the scope and grasp that cyber risk had on entities, right? So I'd say my own background in the government focused on that interconnection of law, policy, and intelligence. And you also had to be successful at both understanding that the interplay of those factors, but also importantly, navigating the nuances of what, at least from my experience, was a somewhat Byzantine government bureaucracy, right? The government doesn't always 
um, function smoothly, as, as, as many people know from some of the current issues going on right now, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have this firm grasp of the bigger picture. Like what's the optimal end gamer solution, right? How is someone else, another agency, another colleague going to respond to my proposal, my recommendation, and so on? So I, I really felt this adaptive mindset served me well during underwriting because I'm simply thinking about and assessing the entire scope of risk and really making a determination whether to support an opportunity or not related broker deliberations. You have to know how to message things properly, not message things properly. Right. So it really has been a, a good, really kind of, again, um, like, like, like experience that, that, that prepared me for underwriting, understanding all the nuances and considerations when you're deciding whether or not to support a risk. Yeah, that's great. And I think you're right. There are so many moving parts within the federal government and it's the same is true for, you know, cyber insurance. So I can imagine that those skills translated pretty smoothly. Um, and then just my last question is, I know that this is a pretty new division for USQ risk. So I'm curious what you hope for the future of para and, you know, what are some of your future plans for the division? Yeah, well, it's still early days. Obviously we just launched a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, I think we're going to be um, being being thoughtful with the, uh, with how we roll these out, but I definitely have plans in place to implement, um, automated underwriting tools and focus. You know, I, I don't think anyone would would inspire confidence in their underwriting strategy and approach for the, the medium and long term if they were like, hey, we're going to have a totally manual process and definitely for the future, right? I don't think that's where the risk is going. It's not where the space needs to go. And I think that to, to, to best serve our brokers, clients, and others, you, you obviously always have to have an eye on, you know, kind of innovation and identifying tools and services that are going to not only hone and improve your own underwriting track record, but obviously um, provide those services and support to your clients. But Really in connection, right? Our focus is on sustainable growth and profitability in that large corporate space, really being a go-to market, a go-to for brokers, working hand, in, working hand in hand with them on providing solutions. And I would say too, you know, within the next couple of years, we definitely have plans potentially to expand to a primary offering in the near future. But of course, with the caveat, we need to get off the ground first. Right. Well, it sounds like you're doing great work already and have a lot of exciting initiatives in place. So congrats on everything you're doing at Para. And this has been a really interesting conversation. So thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Thanks again for having us, Elizabeth. Have a great day. Thanks. To continue the conversation about AI, my next guest is Yasser Andrabi, Global Head of Insurance Strategy and Growth at global professional services firm GenPact. He has nearly 30 years of experience in strategy, growth, and service delivery in the insurance industry, and previously spent almost 13 years at EXL, leading the setup of new engagements for U.S. insurers. He's also advised corporations on their global footprint strategy. He spoke with me about some of the practical use cases for AI tools in insurance, and how he's seeing insurers apply these tools for things like claims, fraud detection, and even regulatory compliance. It was a fascinating conversation about how AI is already being used and ways it could be applied in the future in insurance. Here's what he had to say. Hi, Yasser. It's great to be speaking with you today. How are you doing? Hi, Elizabeth. It is great to speak with you. Thank you. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. I'm really looking forward to sort of diving into your background and talking a little bit about how generative AI is changing the insurance industry. So could you start off with a brief overview of your background and some of the work that you do at GenPact? Sure. I've been at GenPact for uh, six and a half years and uh, in the industry for 27 years, 25 of which has been serving the insurance industry. So I've gone through the cycles of evolution that the industry has gone through in the last two and a half decades. And uh, at GenPact, my role is uh, I lead the strategy and uh, solutions for us uh, globally in the insurance vertical. Awesome. That's great. Well, I'm really glad to be talking to you today. I know that you have great background in this space and, you know, there's so much talk about generative AI and insurance right now. And I was curious just to start off, you know, what you see as some of the most practical ways that insurers are implementing AI into their business. Well, I think uh, uh, insurers started with uh, using uh, generative AI firstly for interactions and it started phase one was more uh, internal to carriers. And uh, this was about uh, getting uh, getting assistance to help call center agents or getting some knowledge management streamlined and quicker answers so that the agents that are servicing customers are able to answer accurately and quickly. And that we saw as phase one. 
And as the technology evolved, as companies started to get more confidence in uh, how the output of generative AI is delivering, it started to expand across the value chain into underwriting claims, managing the uh, actual process of a claim, for example. So uh, in order to actually get to an outcome, uh, the insurance companies started to uh, phase them out into what do we use generative AI for internally and then use cases that are more external and touch a customer. The internal ones took precedence over the external ones. But in the last few months, we're seeing more and more external use cases actually come to proof of concept or even some sort of early deployments, even though it's a ring fence deployment on external use cases for now. Yeah, I think this is really interesting to see how it's evolving. And as you mentioned, you know, the tech tools that are out there are evolving so quickly. So with so many different tools out there for insurers to use, how can they sort of assess the cost and benefit of, you know, various tools to make sure they're selecting the right ones for their business? Well, I think uh, in my mind, uh, the cost and benefit is is a factor of uh, a few or is a function of a few factors. And uh, so, uh, for example, uh, I'd firstly keep out there, you first look for uh, what what is the tool fit for purpose? Uh, what does it bring to the table that is readily usable and its reliability? And then you start to look for uh, three, three major outcome factors, the customer success, the cost, and the growth. And it has to apply to one or all of the three. And then based on your organizational priorities, in the short term and in the long term, you kind of assign weightage to those factors and say, what's my weighted score on each of the tools? So you you make a science out of the art of selecting the tool uh, because one of the things we have to keep in mind is that generative AI is newer technology. And there's not only new companies that bring in tools to, uh, to the market every other week, but you also have tools that existed for the last few months and are getting enhanced almost every other day. So you take the, how does it actually apply to the outcomes that I'm driving that are strategic to my company and use that weightage to score it out. Uh, as far as the reliability of tools is concerned, I think uh, one of the factors that we use to evaluate our own proofs of concept that we build is uh, what is the repeatability of the outcome that it drives and how often can I get the same outcome with the same data set every time? And as I tweak the data set, am I getting an improved and a better outcome? And that's something that I would strongly advise that is tested uh, when, especially when pre-built accelerators are brought to the table, you have to test them to how do they learn and how quickly do they learn and adopt and evolve. And I think those are the three or four factors that one must consider uh, when picking what tool to use and where to use it in which use case. Yeah, I think that's a great framework for insurers to follow, especially as they're getting their arms around some of these tools that are pretty new to them. And I love the idea of, you know, bringing science to the art of selecting the tools, as you mentioned, because, you know, especially now, I know that so many analysts are predicting that the timeline for adopting AI will increase significantly over the next few years. I was reading a Gartner report that predicted that by 2024, 40% of enterprise applications will have embedded conversational AI, um, which is up from 2020. So I was curious with that in mind, you know, what challenges does such a rapid pace of acceleration present for the insurance industry and how can the industry navigate all of this change? I think the biggest uh, biggest uh, problem to solve is what is the data availability and how is my technology landscape today fit for purpose to actually drive this and adopt it? Because even before you come to the challenges of adopting at speed is the challenge of actually being ready to adopt because you can have all the blueprints uh, that you want, but if you're not uh, technically sound and if your data is not clean, it is not uh, available in a manner that can be consumed, uh, you have a bigger challenge uh, to begin with. Having said that, the speed of uh, the speed of change will actually have lesser of a negative impact if you are set right. So I think uh, in my in my view, whenever I speak with clients, step one is. Uh, how am I prepared to start the journey? If I prepare well, 
I will have lesser changes when I go at speed. So don't rush into it. Don't haste. Uh, don't make haste to try and get something live. So that would be one. The other thing is when you go at speed, you know we've all heard of the term uh, AI hallucination and AI bias, and uh, you have to almost pick use cases, especially during the early stages of your journey. You have to pick use cases that, uh, with a human in the loop to keep ensuring that uh, you're not creeping up with biases into your models. And that becomes an essential part to ensure that you don't run 100 miles and then you have to stop or take a step back. So again, just to recap that thought, if you want to have uh, minimized challenges and adoption at speed, take as much time as you need to in order to set the base strong, get your data right, get your technology stack right. As you then start off, make sure that you're not eliminating humans, for sure not in the first cycle of it. And uh, I think that will lead us to a successful implementation all the time, every time. Yeah, I think that's great advice that, you know, no matter how quickly things are are changing with AI, it's important to take your time and make sure that you really think things through, which will end up benefiting you in the long run. So I think that's important advice for insurers as they're thinking about adopting these tools. And it kind of leads into my next couple of questions as well, because I know as the use of generative AI speeds up, I've spoken to a lot of others who are predicting that the regulatory landscape will speed up as well. So I was curious what insurers should know or be thinking about when it comes to AI regulation. Uh, that's a very interesting topic. A lot has been said in that or hypothesized in that. I think uh, regulators uh, have to think about embedding uh, more technologists in their in their own organizations before we can talk about what regulations will come into the AI space in the uh, in the insurance industry. Uh, I think we are evolving towards that, where regulators are going to keep looking at that. I. I think the controls where uh, people are looking at uh, regulations where you need a certain license to make a certain underwriting decision, or you need a license to be able to uh, to make a medical necessity diagnosis for, say, a workers' compensation claim. Uh, I think the, the base principle of that will not change, may not change, but how one approaches that decision being made with a licensed nurse in conjunction with a machine-aided recommendation, I think that's what will change. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, if I agree that it's going to be at pace. I think it is going to be in phase manners where we're probably going to see more adoption in, uh, in areas that lead up to a decision rather the actual decision itself. Uh, and as regulators start to get more comfortable with uh, with the AI recommendations, which are non-biased and which are more in favor of a fair fair adjudication, let's say for a claim, uh, I think we'll start to see that adoption then expand into more uh, decisions that can be relied on on the machine. Uh, until such time, I think reg regulations will continue to be more focused on uh, on the process that runs up to the decision rather than the decision. And the decision will continue to be done by a human who has all the relevant uh, requisites from the regulators as they exist today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's important to keep that human element involved as well. So that's a good point. And another interesting thing that I've heard regarding regulation is that generative AI can be used to actually assist insurers with regulatory obligations because they can go through large amounts of documents and sort of more efficiently adhere to those regulations. So I was wondering if you could talk about what you're seeing there. Actually, that is that is one of the big use cases uh, being solved for, like uh, legal and regulatory compliances, the contracts that uh, that an insurance company writes with the, with the insured. Uh, I think as part of that, uh, you can use Gen AI for benchmarking and being able to use uh, use clauses in your contract that are more simplistic, more succinct, but are also able to uh, to cover you on all the bases on regulators. Now, over time, as the machine learns, those will become more, I believe, user-friendly and will, uh, while keeping in line with the regulators. I think it'll also extend into using generative AI for uh, large amounts of data mining that then leads to regulatory reporting. So regulators will most likely also see that 
they will get quicker, better, more accurate responses from insurance companies every time they have a question uh, than how it has been in the past where a human had to compile and summarize and go through hundreds of pages of documents. Uh, so it's not only that uh, it improves the insurer's ability to be compliant, I think it also helps the regulators in uh, speed of getting responses back from insurers on every time they have a question or they want to dig into a case. So you mentioned how AI is impacting claims, but I'm curious in terms of product development, how you're seeing generative AI assist insurers with um, moving that forward. I think generative AI has fueled hyper-personalization of, uh, of products. So you're going to continue seeing uh, products evolve to cover the risks that are very, very personalized to, uh, to situations. So there will be a flurry of personalized, personalized products resulting in uh, continuous engagement. And generative AI will help provide a granular view of risk categories to improve the profiling and lead generation. And I think you know, uh, these policies will be more personalized and will eventually lead to the identification of new segments that are traditionally underserved risks. And uh, this will, this will not only almost evolve by itself into creating new products, but even if the product core remains the same with personalization and using generative AI to actually write a personalized policy, one can create branches to that core product that are fit for purpose for, for me as a consumer at that point. So I think not only new products, but also uh, just deviation from the core backbone of the product that exists to create a personalized product that fits my situation better. Yeah, I think this is really interesting because I know I've heard from a lot of people in the industry that this is a big hang up for insurers just going through all of those documents and getting everything together to meet those regulatory obligations. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves with generative AI in the future. And, you know, we've talked about so much so far in this conversation, but, you know, given everything that we've talked about, I was curious what you hope for the future of AI and insurance. And if there are any particular areas within insurance where you see it being used the most or if it'll just likely be across the board at insurance companies. <laughs> uh, I, I laugh because uh, the easiest answer there is it will be across the board at some point. The question is when. You know, you almost uh, plot it on a time series of what will get prevalent uh, by when. Uh, so it's not a question of uh, what will get adopted. It is a question of by when will the entire value chain adopt the generative AI. Uh, I think during the early days, uh, if I was to take, uh, say, underwriting, uh, hyper-personalization of policies and risks to be covered will probably be one very good use case that will start to pick up uh, much quicker than many other use cases. Uh, this is following, I guess, uh, the interactions that we spoke about earlier, where it's whether it's chatbots or it is even voice interactions that are guided by AI, it could be for scheduling or it could be for answering some of the basic questions. In the good old days, we used to have the IVR answer scripted. You can use generative AI as a layer on top, which can be more interactive and be able to provide you way more details than just a configured IVR. Uh, so those, I guess, are the first few use cases. But as you go along the value chain, uh, Genpact has worked on a POC and fairly advanced in one of the things which, which we call the missing information in assistant and where we use generative AI for not only identifying the missing information from, from the application and for large commercial, but also looking for what is publicly available information that can be used to fill a lot of that information that was missing in the application itself. So you've taken away the precious time that a broker or uh, the customer would have had to do, and you're go you've taken away all of the back and forth. I think that is uh, something that is going to pick up very quickly. Uh, in the claims world, uh, for example, property claims, uh, content pricing is a ripe use case for quick adoption in addition to FNOL and intake, where generative AI can not only take uh, context-based interactions, uh, recreate, a, say, an accident scenario for an auto claim or a loss scenario for a property claim, which helps quicker adjudication. And then once you have a property claim where you have contents to be replaced, 
using generative AI and benchmarking, you're able to then uh, offer the best fit price for a replacement of that article and close the claim quicker. Now, in this example, you've hit all the three factors that I spoke about earlier, customer success and experience, cost of doing business because you did it faster, and it keeps attracting more renewals because you're now improving experience and therefore growth for the company. So you know, I always look at use cases that hit all the three or at least two of the three to make sure that they can be adopted. And those are the ones that I think will be faster adoption uh, because those are high volume and uh, they require high data scraping and ability to go into various sources and consume data differently. Yeah, I think this is really interesting and such a helpful conversation because, you know, like I said, there's so much talk about generative AI and insurance right now, but it's helpful to know some of the practical use cases that we're seeing today and also, you know, where things could go in the future. So I just really appreciate your time. I've learned so much from you and, you know, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Finally, I spoke with Dustin Ping, associate at Silicon Foundry, a membership-based innovation advisory firm. Prior to joining Silicon Foundry, Dustin was a senior research analyst at the Brattle Group in its securities practice. He spoke with me about a newer trend in AI called model benchmarking and how insurers are using it to not only compare their own progress implementing new technology with industry peers, but also measure the success of deploying AI tools within their business. He also discusses how insurers can avoid getting stuck in what's called POC purgatory, or proof of concept purgatory, when new AI tools are stalled during the development stage and never have a chance to scale across their business. Check out the advice he shared for managing all of this and more. Hi, Dustin. It's great to be speaking with you today. How are you doing? Hi, Elizabeth. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really well, thanks. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to speaking with you. I know we're talking about some of the trends with AI adoption and benchmarking and insurance, um, and I'm looking forward to that conversation. But um, before we get into that, I was just wondering if you could start off with a brief overview of your background and your role at Silicon Foundry. Sure, yeah. So uh, I'm an associate at Silicon Foundry. Uh, We are a San Francisco-based firm, and we advise global Fortune 500 corporates on uh, mostly innovation strategy. So we usually operate as an extension of our members' uh, CVC strategy innovation departments. Um, and earlier this year, several of my colleagues and myself moved to Dubai to help launch the corporate innovation arm of the Dubai International Financial Center. Um, so there we sort of advise financial services firms in the MENA region on things like their uh, AI adoption strategy, among uh, other things. Oh, that's great. Well, congrats on the move to Dubai and the opening of that new branch. That's exciting. Um, Yeah, and I know you have a lot of great background in the AI space. AI is being talked about everywhere right now, so I'm excited to have this conversation. Um, And I know that model benchmarking is sort of a newer trend with AI adoption, especially in insurance. So I was wondering if you could talk about um, what that is and how it all works. Sure, yeah. So uh, model benchmarking, um, in a nutshell, is sort of the application of different performance metrics to uh, AI solutions that are implemented uh, at an insurance firm, for example. So uh, in my mind, there are two main types of model benchmarks. So one is more of the technical benchmarks, right? Those measure the actual performance of the AI solution based on different metrics like precision, accuracy, recall. Um, And then there are sort of the product value benchmarks, right? So those are um, meant to measure the actual impact on the end user's journey or end user's workflow. And those are things like retention rates, churn rates, um, daily and monthly active users. Um, So both technical and product value benchmarks are equally as important for insurance companies as they approach um, building uh, and launching AI solutions. Um, Because they want, at the end of the day, the insurance company wants to meet the intended objectives that align with their strategic initiatives. Um, and it's important because sort of AI adoption and insurance, uh, at the end of the day, always must enhance the end user journey or end user workflow. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know that modeling and the use of data and insurance is always a big thing, but AI um, feels so new because even though it's been around for a while, it keeps evolving. So, um, you know, insurers are constantly having to keep up with it. And I know that you mentioned in some info that you sent that model benchmarking can be helpful because sometimes AI solutions get stalled in the proof of concept stage and then um, insurers or businesses can struggle to scale them across their business. So I was curious if you could talk about some of the challenges that you're seeing there. Sure. Yeah. Um, so what we're hearing from a lot of sort of CDOs and CTOs at insurance companies is that launching these proof of concepts or POCs are is is difficult because you get to the stage where it's called POC purgatory or pilot purgatory, where none of these pilots are able to scale across the organization. So you launch a POC and then it just sits there. Um, and so a, a shocking figure that I, I, I heard a couple of months ago is that only about 10% of AI models that, that are tested by financial organizations actually make it to production and scale within the organization. So um, a couple of challenges that we've seen uh, in this space is uh, one is the high complexity of workflows. So at insurance companies, at financial services organizations, the there's a lot of interdependence uh, workflows, and that sort of increases the risk of error propagation across all of these workflows. So when you're building an AI solution, you want to be cognizant of that, and you want to make sure that um, the results that are produced by the AI solution are accurate and don't uh, will not result in errors that uh, sort of uh, cross a lot of different workflows. Um, and the second challenge is uh, legacy data architectures, right? So things like data silos prevent uh, sort of efficient and unified access to a lot of the data across the organization. So um, those are often needed in order to train ML models or to uh, fine tune them. So uh, at insurance companies, what we found is there's um, you know a lot of legacy data architectures that prevent that. So um, overall, the important challenge to sort of POCs scaling across an organization um, is also the lack of human adoption. For, for of AI tools, right? So you can build a perfectly technically perfect AI tool, um, but if people don't use it within the organization, or if your end customers don't aren't, don't use it, then um, you don't provide sort of that lasting value um, to the end users. Yeah, sure. That's helpful to know some of the challenges, and you sort of touched on this already. But in what ways or what steps, I guess, can insurers take to sort of navigate some of these challenges, and how can they use benchmarking? to evaluate their own progress compared to industry peers and sort of monitor the development of AI within their company? Sure, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are sort of two buckets of benchmarks, right? So there's the technical and then there's the product value benchmarks. Um, and so for insurers to, I guess, evaluate their own technical progress um, against industry standards and industry peers, um, they can use uh, benchmarks for things like precision and accuracy to understand how their solution matches up against the best in class solutions that, that are being provided by maybe other insurers or other financial institutions. So for example, if an insurance company uh, wants to build uh, a customer facing chatbot that is enabled by some large language model, um, they can use benchmarks like perplexity to uh, gauge how linguistically coherent and grammatically, grammatically correct that chatbot is, and then compare it to industry standards to see how the development of the chatbot has is matching up to, um, to the rest of the industry. Um, and in my opinion, more importantly, insurers should use benchmarks, uh, the product value benchmarks. So the ones like daily active users, churn rates, also net promoter scores, um, to benchmarks so are the actual demonstrated value that their AI solutions have for the end users. Again, building a technically capable AI solution means nothing if no one uses it. And so these benchmarks should be able to give the insurer a good sense of how, one, worthwhile their investment is, and uh, two, how likely it is that end users will, will uh, find it sticky, find the product sticky. So they really should treat um, these AI solutions as more like internal products and less of just um, an AI-enabled sort of gimmick product, let's say. Yeah, that makes sense. And you've given a great framework so far for insurers to sort of navigate all of these challenges and make sure that they're implementing AI solutions um, in you know a smart and efficient way. But do you have anything else to add about the steps that can be taken to sort of avoid getting stuck in that POC purgatory that you mentioned? 
Yeah, sure. So um, I guess to avoid sort of the POC purgatory trap or pilot purgatory trap, insurers, I, I think it would behoove them to establish a clear um, set of stage gates and success criteria for um, for any AI project. So that means sort of setting specific milestones and metrics that the POC must meet to progress to the next stage of development, and then to eventually arrive at the go no go decision, which is always the most crucial one. Um, and to do this, uh, I think insurers should look into establishing a strong and sort of agile governance board to drive the POC progress forward. Uh, so to see it through the uh, stage gates and to use benchmarks as a sort of guiding tool uh, to make those crucial decisions. And uh, in order to sort of get buy-in from the rest of the organization, it's also uh, critical to involve sort of key stakeholders early in the process. And that's to ensure alignment, to ensure buy-in. And it also ensures that there's um, that only viable and sort of like useful AI solutions are scaled across the organization, um, and that the, those solutions align with um, align with strategic business objectives and the customer needs. Yeah, that's a great point. And that leads into my next question too, because I was curious, I know as we talked about at the beginning, AI is constantly evolving and there are so many tools and solutions out there. So what are some things that insurers should consider when they're deciding whether to scale their use of AI or you know, what tools would be right for their business? Yeah, sure. Um, so... That's a great question. I think when deciding to scale AI use across an organization's businesses should always uh, ask themselves, do I really need AI to build a solution or can it be satisfied with some other approach or another method, right? So for example, um, specifically within financial services and insurance, uh, some compliance use cases might actually be better served with uh, rules-based algorithms versus a more a AI-enabled approach. Um, and that's uh, due to things like explainability, right? Uh, and so that's one thing that I think that um, you know, insurers should always think about. And the second is to have an honest look into the current like core infrastructure and data architecture within the organization. Um, because that will oftentimes determine things like feasibility of you know, actually implementing this product and then uh, eventually the scalability of that product across the organization. Yeah, that makes sense. And this has been a really helpful conversation and, you know, how insurers can, um, you know, implement AI solutions and how they should be thinking about the use of AI. I know this has been such a big conversation. We're getting toward the end of the year. So I guess I was curious, kind of forward looking into 2024, how do you expect to see AI continue to transform insurance in the coming year? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, the headline, you know, on everyone's newspaper is generative AI, right? So I think that generative AI will continue to make headlines into 2024. Um, but I also think that there will be a sort of pivot to smaller language models and more fine-tuned models that are specialized for certain use cases within insurance, right? So an example of that that we've been seeing is uh, op so OpenAI's release of ChatGPT with vision. Those uh, sort of vision algorithms could uh, eventually be fine-tuned and are currently being fine-tuned to provide uh, more accurate visual assessment for, let's say, claims estimates, right? Um, and also, I think another interesting um, area to explore is the growing amount of space data. So data from satellites that are launched into space are quickly being leveraged to provide, to fuel and train sort of new AI models that can analyze that data and then provide uh, insights for things like parametric insurance for uh, flood damages. So I think um, the there's a lot of you know exciting developments within AI, and I think a lot of them will um, eventually be applied and are currently being applied to to insurance. So it'll be interesting to keep an eye on. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see what happens in the coming year. And space data sounds like we need a whole new episode about that in insurance because that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I've learned so much and you know really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for our final episode of 2023. Thanks to Jeffrey, Yasser, and Dustin for taking the time to speak with me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Once again, my name is Elizabeth Blasfield, and I'm the host of the Insuring Cyber Podcast, a bi-monthly look into how the world of cyber and the business of insurance are connected. 
I hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday break and be sure to check back as new episodes resume publishing every other Wednesday starting January 17th. You can check us out wherever you get your podcasts. Talk to you next time.